You're certainly still tuned into TR Coffee on High Impact Television. The conversation that we are deconstructing and looking into this morning is the Student Learns Act. Now, in the first hour of Tea or Coffee, we did a survey and we actually um, ran through some of the views from the net. Mm -hmm. You know, people giving us their opinions and a perspective on Student Learns yes. Act. We saw diverse opinions. Some people were not really happy with it. You know, some people are worried about the employability of, in the country at the moment that given the Student Learn Act, would they be able to secure jobs to pay back? And some others actually lauded um, the initiative by President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. Now, thank you for still staying tuned to Tea or Coffee. Um, we started this conversation as I, as I, as, as I established um, with opinions from viewers who share their thoughts regarding this. Now, we're going to be moving into the segment of the show where we hear from a professional. Now, Mark Amanza is a public affairs commentator who also works in the development sector that is focused on democratic governance. He's also a friend of the house. Thank you for joining us, Mark. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm fine. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for inviting me again. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. All right. So this morning, we're actually looking into the Student Loans Act, um, recently signed by President um, Bola Ahmed Tinubu. Can you give us, um, before for viewers at home who probably are not sure what this entails, what this means, what is the Student Loans Act all about? Uh, so basically, the, the Student Loan Act um, sets up a, a special bank that is being funded by the federal government um to provide loans for students in public tertiary institutions whether it's a university polytechnic college of education but they will be owned by the federal or the state government or state governments um to able to pay um to subs enable them pay their fees in these schools um and the requirements are basically that those you know, students who qualify for this must have um, family income of less than 500,000 naira per annum um, and it's an interest-free loans which they start paying back two years after um, their NYC so basically three years post-graduation um, bef before they start paying back those loans um, to qualify they apply to their institutions and they need to bring like guarantors and there are certain requirements for guarantors uh, civil servants above grade level 12 um, judicial officers um, you know in the certain requirements are provided for for that so in a nutshell basically that is that's it and and the key thing like i said about funding is to be funded by one percent of um government revenues whether it's from the firs immigration service or the custom service um as well as um um other gifts and but the one percent of the of government revenues is the most critical thing towards funding um that's this special bank all right, now, what measures have been put in place for defaulters? Because you've told us where they're getting the funding from, and there's like, what are the measures put in place for defaulters? I'm sure that's what's resonating on people's mm. minds. With loan sharks, I mean, we've seen the challenges with loan sharks as well. Yeah, so um, one of the, some of the measures they're putting in place, first of all, to ensure prepayment is where they have said, where two years post NYC, you pay back from 10% of your monthly income. If you are self-employed, you provide your you know, documents of no restriction of your business and so on, and they pay back by 10% of your monthly profits. Uh, for defaulters, you either, is it either a two-year jail term or a fine of 500,000 there or both. Um, so the idea is, is um, to ensure that people who benefit from this scheme actually repay and do not just um, benefit and then you know, you don't hear from I'm them Scott. again. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, s some people have uh, are a bit concerned about the, um, you know, this process of for, for the defaulters. You know, some people, you know, in, in, our, in the survey that we carried out, um, some people, uh, you know, mentioned that, you know, if there are no jobs to essentially pay back the student loans, why are they being, you know, um, being, why, why do they qualify for a jail term? Mm -hmm. So, like, what, 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 what is your reaction to that? I understand those concerns, and I think I should just make it clear that I'm not speaking on behalf of the government. Oh, yeah. I'm speaking as some. So, but I, I understand those concerns. And I think the, the mistake many people are making is looking at this um, bill or this act as a silver bullet hmm. to anything. 
you know, or to economic issues, which for me, I don't, I don't think it is. It's not even a silver bullet to funding um, tertiary institutions, which we have a serious problem in terms of there's a huge funding gap for our tertiary educational institutions. Mm -hmm. So my belief or my expectation is that as this bill is happening or this law has come into place, the government needs to also make take those decisions that will open up the economy. Nigeria has a lot of potential in our economy. Um, when we we've we've gone through we've gone through two research recession in the last eight years, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of potential to make things better and to open up the economy to create economic opportunities and jobs with that. So those two have to go you know hand in hand as the economy is growing and people are able to come out and able to get those jobs. But at the same time, it's critical for me. I see this bill as being really critical because, like I said earlier, we have a huge funding gap with our institutions. It's one of the reasons why we keep having strikes after strikes after strikes, um, you know, because from the 70s, we have this idea that, you know, it's government's responsibility to provide free tertiary education for everybody. And where does a lofty goal, and I wish that was possi possible, it's not just within the means of the government to do that. We are not in Norway or Finland with 5 million people. We're 200 million people. We have our out of school children population alone is bigger than this entire population of these countries. Yes. And in the process, something has got to give. We have made the trade off, unfortunately, over the last few decades of declining education quality and tertiary institutions for this illusion of free university, free tertiary education. And I'm saying tertiary, not just university, uh, free tertiary education. But the quality of our graduates. And our systems keep dropping. If you have passed through a public university or public institution in Nigeria, you can bear testament to that. You have class sizes that are insanely large. You have people who go through science-based courses and don't know how to run lab experiments. You know, people who have graduate and then can barely express themselves. Those who come out and are exceptional graduates are most often a product or as a result of the excellent basic education they had and not so much the tertiary education education that they received. So for me, it's 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 if this as this has come into place, for me I feel like the government shouldn't just stop here. It's not just it's not a silver bullet, it shouldn't just stop here and, and feel the work is done. Look at a holistic reform of the tertiary education system. And if you pair it as is happening with opening up the economy, increasing economic opportunities, those that are creating jobs, you those questions that people have regarding how will people get the jobs to pay back these loans those become they, those questions become answered yeah you know I, I i thank you actually very much for that very insightful answer you know i some i you know i've been looking at the student loan act and looking at the criteria for the five hundred thousand annually and below it makes me wonder you know um what's forms of communities or families um, that would be actually very interested um, in actually applying for these mm -hmm. loans. Earlier on the show, we established that, um, you know, a lot of negative reactions are probably coming from cosmopolitan cities like Lagos, Port Harcourt. But how about the rural areas? You know, how do you think the rural communities um, would actually um, look at this loan act? So for me, I think that a lot of people will jump at this opportunity. And you, you may be right in saying a lot of people, um, there's a lot of us who um, are a bit in our own cocoons and think who will access this. But for a lot of people, that 500000 naira annual income is really something that's out of reach for them. Um, so they will really look at the opportunity of, okay, how do we fund um, tertiary education? How do we fund our children's education? And this is an excellent opportunity. Um, is even as with the level of um our subsidized and inadequately funded educational system it's out of reach of many people and if you look at if you look at um where people say they might it might be and even the president has said there may be a need to charge more cost reflective tuition fees it will even be now further out of mm. reach so there are a lot of people who want of this but at the same time that limit is also important so that is those who absolutely need it that access it we don't have a situation where those who don't need it access it and then those who are in need are out of uh, unable to get it so it now becomes we now have a you know a repetition of what we had through the years of fuel subsidy for example where those who were well off were the bigger beneficiaries and yes. those who didn't have vehicles
Mm. All right. So now my concern is, it seems like 500,000 Naira is a lot of money. But in reality, is that enough for a tertiary education? Let's say, for example, university education that is four years. I understand that um, school fees and setting like even housing and all accommodation might not be so high if we think about it but when we think of assignments projects doing all these things is five hundred thousand naira really enough or is just literally just to cushion the effect of what it costs to um, take a child through school the, the law doesn't say you can only with borrow a maximum of five hundred thousand. It says you have to have an income not higher than five hundred thousand per annum mm. to access the loan. There's mm. no loan size limits that have been set. Mm. Um, so, but I, I found to understand your point. We can't really say how much will be the loans that be given, and I think those are the things where maybe the law is not enough to capture all of that. It comes down to running of the of this education fund or bank that those details will be worked out. But my thinking or my expectation is. We need to even know how much should tertiary education, education cost. You know, many people, and, I, and this may be a digression from your question. Many of us in Nigeria are not even aware of of how much, to what level of subsidies are we got, uh, do we get in our schools? Because we don't even know how much it costs in the first place. It's not like, for example, if you compare it to a system, let's say in, in the United States or Canada or in the no place where they have um, federal funding for students, they will tell you, okay, this is how much the education cost but it's in some funding there will be the discount a scholarship so you can see how all of that adds up we don't get that here but the last available stats i could find for example as at 2000 the government estimate for students in universities was that 970 dollars per student that was in 2000 between three years ago even if you apply exchange rate of today per year to say 972 dollars per student that's under 700 thousand naira and this includes, so yeah, they are estimating that per student. And from that estimate, you're looking at paying salaries, providing facilities, funding research, you know, and then you can now pay a look at the outcomes. And it's not surprising that the outcomes we get are terrible. Mm. So we have to look at it from the fact that, look, we have a huge funding gap. We have a, we have a huge funding gap. Um, so... I'll work out it. The schools get paid directly students are not being paid you're not being given the money to go and pay so it's not like a chance where you're going to get the money and then go and squander it something else mm. schools are being paid directly but it's you know that's being you know gone towards your tuition so these are the things that when you look at when i talk about the uh, holistic reform even the way schools approach how they price their education the education they provide needs to change in terms of knowing this is the name this is the nameplates cost of this you know education I'm going to receive per year and then if we add all these discounts and whatnot and scholarships this is how much you have to pay by yourself these are all the details that are not captured in the law all right, so that's pretty interesting. It's for us to also ask the government the question, please, can you give us a clear blueprint to know what it is? And I mean, I'm, I'm just glad that he, he brought to our knowledge yeah. as regards the fact that we don't get these breakdowns mm -hmm. of actually what it costs to go to certain higher institutions. Mm -hmm. And it's something we'd, uh, we need to um, look at. Actually, so yeah. how successful do you think the student loan act can be in the run in the in the long run? Is it sustainable in Nigeria? It all goes down to implementation. It all goes down to implementation. I think one aspect of it that makes gives it a good chance of sustainability is the funding plan. One percent of government revenues, as long as the government exists, government will continue to collect revenue to sustain to provide services and to sustain itself. So 1% of that, and as it increases, you have increased funding, which takes care of its interest-free nature. For the remaining aspects of the factors that will make it successful, it all depends on how it's implemented in itself, and also how other reforms around the education sector will support it. Because if the, a mistake that the government will make, whether it's at executive level or at tertiary level or at legislative level, is to assume that the work is done. The work is not done. Mm. We need, and I keep saying again and again, one of my biggest grouses is we have strikes after strikes after strikes by whether it's ASU, SANU, NASU, ASU, whatever alphabet soup we can think of. And yet nobody, not, not nobody within government, outside of government, or even within these industrial unions has come up with a better idea of how we're going to holistically reform the sector. 
we have continued to believe this illusion that the government can't fund it entirely by itself. Look, there's always a case for more government funding for education. Always. And not just in Nigeria, anywhere in the world. But more especially in Nigeria, where we need it desperately. There's a desperate need to increase that funding. But we also need to look at it like in terms of how much government funding, how much funding can government really provide? So this is the first major reform of the sector in decades. Maybe since 2000, when the Obasi administration allowed or started licensing private universities. Mm. This is the first major reform. Mm. And it's a bit of a shame that it's taking us up to three years at least to get to this point. So now it's for the government, this government, this National Assembly, to now take it up. No, these labor unions take it up and start looking at, okay, let's go further. How else can we make this do a wholesome change in the system and not just stop here? All right, now let's look at it from the student's perspective. Now we had, uh, during the views from the net segment, we had a respondent who said something about uh, being seen as somebody who is getting a loan. So as a student, they see you as someone who's getting a loan. Mm. And even when you're working, you're seen in that way. Now, if this is successful, what are the implications to Nigerian students and their higher education in Nigeria? Looking at it and also from the perspective of what the respondent said. I don't think there's anything about shameful in receiving a loan or getting financial aid to go to university, to go to school. There should be nothing shameful in that. If there's anything that has the capacity to change the trajectory of anybody's life in terms of their income is education mm. and whatever means you can do to get that legal means i should point out Legally. it's not something yeah it's something that we should you, should you should always be proud of you know um but one thing i see is that the desire the potential of improving quality you know improving quality i i mean i i i have i i grew up on two campuses i have been opportunity to sit down in job interviews where i have known and i've seen the quality of people who come in and oftentimes you look at the universities the systems the teacher education system and it keeps declining so if we have to do this to you know as part of the measures to improve that quality i think we should all go for it oh. this should be not in shameful in saying um i mean look at the fact that it's very interest free if if you school again to make a a, a comparison with the, with the united states for example which has one of the most advanced teacher education systems in the world, if not the most advanced, it has it. You, you leave school and you have a huge debt burden. We are paying off student loans, mm -hmm. and as it is, it's also looking at the fact that we, for the population we have, you know, you could make the argument that that's overly commercialized, which in some respects it is, but we don't have the resources to provide that free education like we would if we were a country of five million or six million people. Mm -hmm. hmm. All right. All right, now as we begin to wrap up, we need to know what lessons do you think we can learn from existing models in other parts of the world? I know um, the United States of America have a student loan structure, same thing with the United Kingdom, and you just mentioned another one. Um, what can we learn from these models? So I think there's, there's hardly any model that, will, that applies perfectly to our situation. We have to still adapt, mm. pick and adapt, you know. Um, so on one hand, like I said, uh, for the size of our population, you know, it it will be foolhardy of us to keep living under the illusion that government can't provide that entire funding. I I I don't deny I have a bias towards the the, the United States system. It's one that closely resembles you know what we, we could do, uh, minus inter putting interest on loans because for the size of population, um, you know, it, it's it's we have that huge population that we need. To provide education for um so i would say look at that seriously we also borrow there are also elements from other places we can borrow you know the, for example you look at reforming their system um the uk where we borrowed our system from you know in the 1992 you know passed a law that converted polytechnics and monotechnics to degree award institutions and for us we also need something like that because we have this disparity which sadly also reflects in the law if you look at the law, it looks at the governing board for this education bank, gives a sort of bias towards universities. And we need to also look at the fact that beyond universities, we also desperately need polytechnics and college of education and monotechnics. But today you have students who will rather go to universities than go to those polytechnics because from the 70s, we had this policy in government where HND holders don't go as high as some degree holders. Mm. And instead of one and third other effects. So we need to look at all these systems, you know, South Africa, all these countries, and look at and do a good comparative study and see what best can we take to 
apply to our own unique situation. It's been a wonderful conversation yes, with you. Has. Thank you very much.